So I would like to go ahead and welcome our next speaker to the stage, Paul Coggan. From, uh, he is a cyber SME at New Systems, Inc. His expertise includes space systems, service provider, and ICS SCADA network infrastructure attacks and defenses, as well as large complex network design and implementation. Paul is experienced in leading network architecture reviews, vulnerability and analysis, and penetration testing engagements for service provider enterprise space systems and tactical networks. Paul is a regular instructor at international conferences teaching networking, hacking, and forensic courses. He has a BS in math, computer science, MS in systems management, MS in information assurance and security, and MS in computer information systems. Paul is currently pursuing his MS in space systems. In addition, he holds numerous industry network and security certifications. So please welcome Paul to the stage with Pwned in Space. Thank you, Jane. It's great to be uh, back here in the Caymans. This is my second time to uh, visit the Cayman Islands. It's, uh, it's beautiful. It's one of my uh, favorite places to visit in the world. The island is so beautiful. Food, the people, the scenery, and as you well know, the beaches, it's, uh, the reefs are just amazing here. Being able to see all the stingrays and starfish, it's just uh, it's an amazing uh, place you have here. Uh, so this talk, we're going to talk about uh, space systems and cybersecurity. And we're not, I'm going to not do a focus on the ground system. We're going to focus on events that have actually happened in space primarily uh, around cyber. Because there's so much in the news these days you have with uh, Ukraine, uh, SpaceX, uh, Biosat, there's a lot of conversation about that in the news. Uh, and then all the uh, satellites that are going up in space, providing internet services from space, uh, all the new launch capabilities. So I wanted to go and uh, put some coverage on what, what's been happening in the past up to this point with uh, space and uh, cyber, but, but uh, focused on the satellite portion of it, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about the space station as well. But So when we talk about space, if you come from an enterprise background or telco service provider background, you're familiar with uh, a network operations center, your security operations center, where you're monitoring the health and status of your network infrastructure. Maybe you have it in the cloud where you, you're collecting all your telemetry data and you know the health and status of the network infrastructure, your apps, your servers, et cetera. Well, similarly for, uh, for systems that are in orbit in space, organizations similar, similarly to uh, say NASA here in this example, they have uh, ground stations around the world located so that they can can continuously monitor no matter where the spacecraft is in orbit, they can always go and uh, send commands to uh, pull health and status, maybe send commands to change orbit, uh, pull information imaging from a payload that's on a spacecraft sa satellite. So, the, so that's called the ground station, ground system uh, for uh, the spacecraft. Now, What's really interesting now is everybody's talking about the cloud. I mean, everyone is moving to the cloud. Well, similarly, space systems are as well. And, it's and what it's commonly referred to in the marketing is ground station as a service. But I read, I read the other day where they're talking about space as a service as well is a new acronym that you're going to probably hear more about. Uh, but ground station as a service is where instead of having these private ground stations similar to having you know, your own private network operation center or a private security operation center, the, all these new space 2.0, these new space uh, commercial organizations that are coming online, many of them are pushing those services to the cloud where Amazon, AWS, Google, I, I was reading that Google is going to provide the services to SpaceX for uh, the Starlink satellites. Uh, and so they may eventually offer additional commercial services but and then Microsoft Azure, they have their orbit solution that they're offering cloud-based uh, space services. And there's a company called Kubos. They have an application that they run in AWS called Major Time. 
and, uh, and then there's a leaf space out of Italy, and there's another one I can't recall the name of uh, that I've read about recently out of uh, Portugal that is going to offer a cloud-based service. So space is going to the cloud, so it's really interesting uh, what's happening there. But I also call out, image to you, you might find of interest, is that the cloud is also moving up into orbit. There's a company called Leo Cloud that where they're going to put cloud-based services in space so that they can do processing uh, and analysis in space before they send data to the ground and other similar services. And uh, I was reading where HP has designed a new server for space. And they had to be specially, servers and computers had to be specially designed for space because there's actually weather in space uh, due to uh, the atmosphere and the sun because it's sending all kinds of radiation and uh, particles into space that uh, can affect the uh, computer systems, and we'll talk about that. It messed it up, so those, the HP server is specially designed to provide a server in space. And then I was reading, there's another company called Aim, uh, Ramos out of Israel, and they provide, they've designed a two terabyte hard drive uh, storage system for space here just recently. So that's going, so now we're gonna have cloud in space eventually, which is gonna open up a lot of ideas of how you do forensics, incident response, things that we would do on the ground. Get that, it's hard enough on a cloud on the ground, but now we're gonna do it in space. So it's gonna be a lot of interesting activities in the future with cyber. It's gonna be really exciting, a lot of opportunities. So but when we talk about orbits, we took SpaceX and uh, what uh, some of the other uh, companies are doing more that you read about most uh, frequently with the small satellites, the CubeSats is in LEO, the low Earth orbit. And, and that's up to like 2,000 kilometers. And that's, good. that's what you predominantly are reading about, uh, the, all the frequent launches that, uh, that SpaceX is sending up with their rockets. Most of those satellites are going up into the LEO orbit. And that's where uh, like Space Station is located in LEO. It's closer to the Earth. And it spins roughly, those satellites are rotating around the Earth about, about every four hours, roughly. They're rotating, spinning around the Earth. But when you go to GEO, that is the satellites that you're probably familiar with when you get uh, cable TV services, some of your voice services. Uh, those type of services, are, those satellites are pointing directly at the same spot, same region of the Earth, and it, and it orbits as the Earth orbits up in GEO. And then you have MEO and uh, HEO, the high Earth orbit, the medium Earth orbit. But primarily what you're reading about in the news is the uh, low, low Earth orbit and then the uh, geo orbit. So from a threat standpoint, again, uh, everything in the news here lately, if you've been following what the activities in uh, Ukraine, there was uh, the recent attack. They, spec they said that the, that the Russians uh, attacked Viasat and took out the user terminals for... for uh, for uh, the Viasat internet terminals, like 5,000 plus or 5 million, might have been the number of uh, user terminals. And they got in through, a, uh, through the network management network for the user terminals. And so they were able to degrade and uh, deny service for those end users. And they weren't able to use the spacecraft, but that happened on the user part of the network. But there's other attacks like a deception where somebody might be spoofing information uh, and uh, say, you know, messing with GPS, messing with timing and uh, location where, where you uh, lose, lose uh, track of where you are. And uh, say like if you're a ship floating around, you might be getting uh, your information spoofed. And so you don't, you're not showing up where you're supposed to be. Uh, and then dis and there could be dis temporary disruptions uh, like lasers, microwave, some kind of directed energy attack in like a, a, a electronic warfare where it's, it's jamming the signal and the, the signal it will be jammed and unusable but then it comes back as soon as the power is removed. Uh, and so that'll be a temporary disruption. There's been a lot, a lot of talk here lately about the ASAT attacks where this has been tested where there's actually a missile shot at the, at the satellite and taking out the, uh, the spacecraft, which ends up causing a great deal of debris, and that just totally destroys the spacecraft, but also create, adds to the debris field that is a lot of people, scientists are worried about, that eventually could cause what they call a Kessler syndrome, that if the debris field in space keeps developing like it is, that eventually there could be a chain reaction where a piece of debris hits a spacecraft or another large piece of 
of uh, debris, and it just starts a chain reaction of debris creating, crashing into debris, creating additional debris until the whole uh, low Earth orbit is unusable, and that's called Kessler syndrome. Uh, and there's because of uh, the complete destruction of spacecraft, there's a concern about that. And plus, there's junk that's just been left up there, like rockets and satellites that have not fallen from space yet. Um, and then, uh, and then there's other attacks like, like I think I mentioned, you know, lasers and uh, in the microwave. Now, pr primarily, what we're going to talk about it with this talk, though, is like I mentioned, jamming, electronic warfare. It, the the field of electronic warfare and cyber are converging together, where where uh, somebody might be trying to jam your uh, your radio frequency channel with with high power jammers. Uh, Malware. I've got some examples of malware in space. You might be surprised, but there malware is in space. Uh, and the spoofing and going after the con the control system payload, because the satellite is going to have two components. Typically, there's going to be the computer uh, portion of the satellite that controls how the satellite is flown and the overall health and status of that satellite and keeping it in orbit. And then there's the payload that is the computer system that controls what the mission is of that satellite. You know, if it's taking imagery, if it's communications, what have you, that would be in the payload. And then uh, we're going to talk about attacks like replay and being able to do hijacking and eavesdropping, which is uh, a lot easier than you may realize uh, because there's a, there's a lot of misconception that everything is encrypted. It is not all encrypted. Uh, and, I, and we'll talk about some real-world examples of that. So. Again, what we're showing in this slide is when we start talking about attacks against space systems, if it's like electronic warfare, things like that, it might be easily to recover from those attacks because the, the RF, the radio frequency energy is applied, it jams the signal, and when it, go, and it goes, goes away once that signal is removed. And we've been reading a lot about it that in the news here lately. But when, it, as you move to the right, you start getting into kinetic attacks, maybe a microwave attack, a microwave attack, a high energy, directed energy microwave attack could possibly damage, permanently damage the spacecraft, or uh, lasers could have a really strong laser that gets pointed to the spacecraft and uh, totally disable some of its capabilities or uh, make, uh, do, and do irreparable damage to it, or, of course, shooting a uh, missile at it. There's like four countries right now that have proven that they can uh, hit, a mis hit a satellite in space. India, uh, China, the U.S., and uh, Russia are the four that have uh, actually been, been able to uh, destroy a satellite in space. So hopefully we'll get some treaties in place that will quit doing that and uh, adding debris to the, to the uh, LEO space. Some of the threat actors, the threat actors span the gamut similar Similar to uh, other critical infrastructure industries, whether it's uh, you know a foreign military, uh, some kids sitting at home on their parents' uh, internet connection, with you know just time and a and a high IQ and a lot of curiosity, uh, all the way up to terrorists. Uh, there's a there's a great deal of talk that I've been reading here recently where Russia and China are watching and seeing what's happened, you know, where they were able to affect Viasat, but then. SpaceX and Starlink stepped in and overcame the attacks that were used against Viasat and have been able to bring the internet back up in Ukraine. That's got a lot of people's attention that, that now, hey, what are we going to do when we want to go and, you know, exert influence over a battlefield that how are we going to deal with these thousands of satellites that uh, Elon is putting up in space? So was, that's... I th and that's going to get into all those different uh, different attacks, like the lasers, the microwave, et cetera. But then there's but one of the top attacks of a concern is cyber, because if they can find a way through the supply chain, if they get into the supply chain, you know, from your chips and software all the way uh, through the process, that's a broad attack surface that somebody might be good to. But but there's also all the way down to the in to some kid sitting at home on an internet connection, because a lot of legacy satellite communications are unencrypted, like, a, like everything here on the ground, it's best practices to use, use your own encryption and verify, but uh, it's not always encrypted. 
and the reason being is uh, because of space weather, and we'll dive more into that. So you, so you can set a, you can actually go and get a software-defined radio if you're a hobbyist and passively look at network traffic, and we'll go into some examples of that. So that space threat actors, uh, it's a pretty broad capability there to make just passively or actively engage. Now, I spent many years working on red teams doing penetration testing. I got involved with penetration testing in like 99. In the early 2000s, I got interested in doing attack trees as a way to develop a strategy for the team and uh, for, uh, for reporting. So I like to, I like to use a uh, whole attack tree, mind mapping to lay out strategy. So a real, real simple example, if you're gonna go after somebody's satellite, you know, you maybe you wanna go after the ground station, look at, uh, you know, you wanna analyze your threats, you know, what is the insiders, you know, some, you know what is the likelihood of one of your in, insiders, your engineers, IT people, Janet or someone getting turned, deciding to work for the bad guys. Uh, you know, what, what are those trust relationships out to the internet? You know, and that's kind of like what happened with my understanding with Viasat. The, net, the firewall VPN had a uh, misconfiguration. So some, they were able to come in over the internet, get, a hold, get through the firewall VPN, and then upload some bad code that got distributed to all the user terminals. So going through the ground station. It's theoretical that that could make, might be possible at some point to do a satellite to satellite in space attack. That's purely theoretical. I've not been able to read anywhere where that's actually happened, but I've, I have seen where a couple papers where people are speculating on satellite to satellite type attacks in the future. Or now someone that's more sophisticated, has more resources, might be able to go and bring up their own unauthorized ground station. But typically what you're going to see if someone is going to try to find a way into the existing ground station, whether it's a private ground station or, which I think is going to make it a lot easier, somebody's cloud ground station, because you know if they put it to the cloud, most, most likely they're going to have uh, remote internet access into it, and that's going to open up a whole big broader attack service, as, as this group would know and understand, to uh, exploit that trust relationship and gain access to the spacecraft. Now, I found this really interesting. I started doing this research about known spacecraft attacks, but apparently there's a, uh, it's, it's heavily speculated that when Stuxnet attacked the Ara Iranian uh, nuclear program many years ago, that, that when Stuxnet was spreading, that it actually somehow got, got into the ground station of a cable TV uh, company satellite company in India and took out the Insat 4B satellite and what 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 uh, is stated is that the Insat 4B uh, system was actually using the same uh, Siemens PLC controller for uh, for uh, the uh, solar panels to rotate and turn the solar panels that was using the same PLC and it had the WinCC system on the ground so it was able to uh, turn the satellite so that that uh, it could destroy that spacecraft and disabled it, and so they lost service. Now, on the unencrypted satellite communications, the reason the reason that they're it's all not encrypted is because there's this space weather, like there's solar storms in space. The sun is constantly spewing out. Uh, Particles, ions, electrons, protons, all, all the stuff that you probably just uh, studied in modern physics. It's shooting that out across space, and it goes back to Einstein uh, uh, equation E equal MC squared. It's got enough energy that those little tiny particles have enough energy to fly when it was it is headed toward uh, out into the solar system, toward Earth, etc. It hits those spacecraft. That not only can it, it degrade, it can it can cause uh, it can de degrade the material properties of a spacecraft depending on how what the materials are used on that spacecraft. But if it can get in there, it can also inject itself into the electronics, and it can do what what they call a uh, a single upset event, where it can make the ones and zeros in an electronic board change and flip. So it might have been should have been a one, but it flips to a zero. And, and you know, in this room, everybody understands encryption. You start changing ones and zeros and flipping things, well, what have we done? We broke encryption. We killed our encrypted connection. Now we've got to reset it. We've got to, do, we've got to reboot. You don't want them to have to be rebooting your computer in space. 
because you know it ain't like you can walk down the hall to the data center and and hard boot it when they don't boot up clean, right? A little bit more complicated when it's you know in Leo or Geo. Uh, so that's the reason not everybody does encryption. Now you can use encryption, and it is a heavily used by some organizations, but it drives up the cost of hardening that equipment against the radiation, the hostile space weather. You got to go and, and uh, put a special shielding around that equipment and uh, manufacture it so that it can survive at space uh, at that level. So, and there's a lot of things out in the open source where it's talked about, it's best practices, it's recommended, but they don't do it specifically because of that, because they don't want to lose act. The, uh, the people who control the satellites do not want to lose access to their satellites due to a loss of encryption, which makes sense. So, so some do it, some don't. The lesson learned out of this, where we're going with this, is if, you're, if your business or you know, your home network is using uh, satellite internet, if it's sensitive traffic, if you're under some kind of regulatory regulation like uh, you know, healthcare privacy information, financial privacy information, or using satellite internet, I'd be making sure it's encrypted. Don't, don't believe the sales guys. I'd be encrypting my own traffic. Uh, an example of uh, a re a re some real world examples of unencrypted traffic is in this case, the Navy had a satellite, was using uh, UHF and some um, creative uh, radio people down in uh, Brazil discovered it and they used the open unencrypted satellite that the Navy was using for their radio communications. They turned it into a CB radio network for themselves. And, by the, and eventually, at some point, they found 39 people across uh, six states in Brazil that were utilizing it. And apparently, after they arrested that bunch, uh, more people came online and started using it because everybody knew about it, and it was real easy to hack because it was out there open. You know, if you didn't want people to use it, you should have had it encrypted. Uh, now, here's an example for malware with this, again, showing... That despite what all the you know your ISP might be telling you that it's encrypted, here's a real world example where it's not encrypted. Some of it may be, but not all of it. In this case, we have a piece of malware where you know the malware's got its uh, command control, got that two way handshake of signaling uh, between the uh, the bot that's been infected and the command control server. Well, these guys are pretty smart. This is a sophisticated attack. I wish I was smart enough to think about this, to come up with this idea. Uh, they would, they would, uh, the bot operators had their command control server. They would go put their server out on some, some satellite internet network and just uh, steal somebody's IP space, put it out there on somebody's IP space, just out there and squat out there uh, in like southern Europe, North Africa region, Middle East. They would put, that, put their server out there using whatever arbitrary IP addresses that the satellite internet company was using and it would just wait for uh, the bot, whoever got infected, to phone home. And then whenever they got a signal that from, a, uh, from somebody's computer that had been infected, it would get sprayed down, broadcast from the satellite to everyone in that region of the world. And then the, uh, the C2 server, the malware server, would, would send a connection back to that infected user over a wireline. So it was an async communication. So you've got, you know, you're out there trying to do threat hunting. You're out there trying to monitor and catch the bad guys. You're only going to see one way of signal. One signal is going to go over a wire line, and one signal is going to go over the, be coming in over the satellite. Really, really hard to uh, detect. So, and that would not work if they were using encryption. So it just, that's a good example of proving it ain't, it's not all encrypted. And if it ain't encrypted and you're using satellite internet, you know, better be using some encryption or somebody's going to be sitting out there and looking at it. I can tell you, it's a, it's a lot easier. There's a, there's a couple papers out on Black Hat as well and on, out on SlideShare where it broke down many years ago. A gentleman first published it. I forget his name. And then it was published again a couple of years ago by another gentleman from, that graduated at Oxford University recently. I forget their names. They published. There's a lot of information out there about how to use like software-defined radio really, really cost-effectively as a hobbyist, bring up a capability to, to monitor passively, just passively, just sit there and listen like Wireshark on a, on a you know, sit there on your switch. 
uh, sit there and passively monitor the satellite traffic that's floating around in space. So you need to make sure your stuff is encrypted because we've got a project where we're, we're throwing something up like that and just seeing what's out there and what's all the noise. And it's really, it's really amazing to see. Um, here's another example. Uh, during the Iraq war, there was uh, insurgents. They were able to intercept communications and decode satellite communications. They were unencrypted. And I mentioned earlier about that. Th this is this is something I believe is going to be that we'll read about in the future. I have there's nothing out there to say it's happened yet. It's purely theoretical, but I'm thinking that eventually we're going to be reading about a uh, satellite to satellite attack in space. It's probably going to be easy, it's going to be easier to do with RF with the radio frequency because that's more broader in nature the signaling. But more and more, which is a good thing, more and more of the communications are going to move to optical where it's where they're using free space optics, where the lasers are going to, you're going to point lasers in space at uh, the, the spacecraft, spacecraft to spacecraft, so it's going to be intersat, it's going to be optical, and then the spacecraft to the ground will be optical. And that's going to be a huge improvement for security when it goes optical, because you won't be able to jam it, like is easy, you know, mess with it like you uh, can with uh, radio frequency, because it's a laser. So, so free space optics is going to make it uh, really, really hard. But I'm, I'm just interested to see if, if that ever gets reported as actually occurring. Now here's a, uh, a real-world example of a uh, satellite. This, this ROSAT satellite was created to look into deep space. It was, you know, the, the scientists were trying to go and study deep space, see what's going on out in, out in the uh, solar system. And someone was able to find a way into a ground system and get from that ground system that they, they exploited trust relationships and found their way into, uh, were able to get, go from the ground system up to that satellite and turn that satellite toward the sun and uh, damage the uh, satellite's capability. Which this kind of talk always drives me crazy because it's like SCADA. I, industrial control systems, SCADA, you know, OT. Why is this stuff accessible from the, the internet to begin with? I mean, who designs this stuff? I mean, that should never have been able for someone to get remote access into that sensitive network, but that's another, that's just a, another rant for later. Uh, another example is a uh, Landsat 7 satellite in 2007, 2008. It was hacked for uh, like 12 minutes. Whoever the attackers were, when they, got a, when they got into the satellite, apparently they had full control. They had access, they had access to do whatever they wanted to do, basically like root level access equivalent. But it's, that's about like me getting root level access on a uh, VMS Vax box. You could, you could give me, uh, give me, you could log me into that VMS box, but I don't know DCL. I don't know what I'm doing with VMS, Vax. Some of y'all might be too young to remember VMS, uh, or uh, or some you know, or some other obscure operating system. So the actors, when they got into the satellite, they they did not know what they were doing. So the good guys were able to take control of their satellite back. But the hack happened twice. So my and one so one, one another presentation I'm working on is to go into the details of how these systems are built and the components. And there is a very large number of operating systems. There's a large number of operating systems and protocols and command languages for these satellites. So my speculation is, is someone got, got access probably through the ground system and they got in there, they were able to exploit that initial trust relationship and got into the system. But once they got in there, they were not familiar with the command language and the operating systems and they didn't know what they had and how to operate in that environment because it was just something they were not familiar with, because there is a lot of different command languages and OSs. Another one is this uh, Terra satellite. It got hit in, uh, 2000, in June 2008, and then again in October 2008. It's believed it was the same actors. They, they were able to, get, able to get in somehow, but they were not able to maintain access and really do any damage, because they didn't. It did, my speculation based on all the research I've done, my speculation is, is they probably didn't know the command language, the uh, syntax and the OS environment that they had gotten into. They got the access through whatever trust relationship they were on the ground system, but they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, here's one, 
Uh, this is NOAA. NOAA in the U.S. is a uh, government agency that does weather in the U.S. And apparently in 2014, the Chinese, it's attributed to the Chinese with this one, uh, that they were uh, able to get control of that satellite. We were able to take back control of the satellite, but there for a while the Chinese apparently had taken control of this uh, weather satellite. Now, this was a really interesting one uh, I found. Uh, apparently, uh, in the UK, there's a, there was a satellite constellation called uh, Skynet, and Skynet is composed of four satellites, and, uh, and someone was able to gain access back in 99 and took control of one of the satellites. And it's speculated that it, they, helped, they took control and they held it for ransom. So that's pretty interesting. I mean, there wasn't ransomware, but they held it for ransom. I'm, I'm really, it's going to be really interesting uh, to see how long, with all the thousands and thousands of satellites that are being put into orbit, about how, at what point may we eventually see a ransomware attack in space? Because I read, I read some statistics here recently that whenever SpaceX launches a rocket that has 28 satellites, that there's roughly 4,000 Linux computers on that rocket when, with 28 satellites. That's a lot of Linux. Now they have really good, really good security. They know what they're doing, and they're very strict in their engineering processes. Very disciplined, but but you know, but, uh, with all the CubeSats that everyone's throwing up, and uh, that are, may not have a real strict DevOps, DevSecOps program, it's going it's to be interesting to see how long we might be before we start have seeing uh, say ransomware of a satellite. Uh, the Inter International Space Station. It's been infected a few times with ransomware. It's been, it's been it, not, rans not ransomware, but malware. Hasn't been no ransomware, but just malware. Uh, there was malware introduced through a uh, USB thumb drive at one point, and uh, also malware introduced to space station via infected laptops that were brought on to space station. Now, the, <coughs> the, uh, the flight control system for space station was not under threat. This was a different network where they were plugged in and uh, the malware was uh, infected on the system. <coughs> but, but it made it to space on the space station. It was pretty interesting. Now, there's an organization called the Consultative uh, Committee for Space Data Systems. They come up with all the standards for space systems, satellite systems and the best practices of how satellite systems should be built and designed, and uh, it's just it, including encryption, but like I said, not, you, know, you can write the documents, but you can't make somebody use it. Uh, this is, you don't wanna read this. If you want these slides, I'll give them to you with all these references, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of work going on to document best practices for securing the spacecraft, securing the ground systems, uh, securing the end user terminals. Uh, NIST, it, NIST is doing a great deal of work. They just they recently published uh, a draft document, uh, NIST 8270, for commercial space. They just released another uh, document, uh, 8401, for uh, ground system security. Uh, Aerospace Corporation is publishing a great deal of work. MITER, MIT Lincoln Labs. Um, there was, a, as a result of the uh, Biosat hack, uh, the CISA in the U.S., they just pu published uh, some uh, best practices recommendations for securing uh, satellite networks, and uh, including the user terminal stuff. Uh, and uh, then the, there's the Federal Commun Communications Commission and uh, NOAA, who, who monitors the weather. They, they have uh, their best practices. They basically point you to the, cyber the NIST cybersecurity framework and recommend using encryption. And then there's some others like the Orbital Security Alliance. They, they have some best practices for commercial space systems to uh, consider using. There's a lot out there. It's, just, it's like everything, uh, somebody's gotta read it and actually put a program together and, and implement it throughout the whole design process, the whole life cycle. Which leads into as these new commercial space, space, space systems come online, really need to get DevSecOps type processes involved and start with the whole supply chain with all the coding 
and from the very beginning designed these systems uh, to be secure. It's like, you know, like a lot of it is moving to the cloud, and then and the cloud is moving into space itself to get, this, they, to get these uh, systems locked down from the very beginning uh, and use crypt encryption. Look at hardening the, uh, the systems for whatever is required if they, uh, the orbit that they're going to be in, get them uh, hardened for uh, the radiation and the, the hostile space weather, all the solar flares, et cetera, that are going on in space, the plasma, et cetera. Um, now, something that's new is, is, I've been reading a lot, is satellites now are going to a software-defined model. Software-defined radio is going to be used, which is going to help with jamming and electronic warfare because somebody starts hitting you on a frequency, you can, uh, with, through software-defined radio, you can uh, change your frequencies, change your radio frequency uh, configuration quickly since it's in the software-defined radio. But also, which I might find interesting, I found very interesting, is that it's also moving to using virtual machines and containers in space. And that makes it really interesting, and, and which, which, uh, which enables the new idea of what we're familiar with for many years in our enterprise and other organizations is being able to put an intrusion prevention system and put logging and uh, maybe put some machine learning and AI so that we have, we can able to, we're able to baseline what is normal. How do our engineers, our technicians, when they communicate with the satellites, what are the commands we expect them to send what order the commands coming in, you know, the timing, et cetera. It's probably going to be automated. We're probably going to have that pre-engineered and pre-scripted. And what is going to be that timing that those commands are going to be set and what's expected and be able to apply uh, machine learning, uh, AI to that. And so we can quickly detect, hey, somebody, somebody's figured out how to get access and they're sending commands out of order. And maybe we need to maybe we need to go and boot up a different payload OS or payload container to take over that's more hard and more trusted and more secure until we figure out what's happening because we obviously we got um, we may have somebody trying to help us manage our sats so so that is being tested I was, I was reading that aerospace corporation is about to launch a satellite to test some of these capabilities so that so that's per that's good that they we're headed there uh, and like I said, you know, you got to do the really strict uh, configuration management of the system and know what version of a container or VM you're on and be able to restore back to a known good, uh, you know, in case you uh, have an issue and you, you need to get back to a point of uh, a, trusted, a trusted system. So now we go to containers and VMs. This is going to be a whole lot easier to do. Maybe we don't have to reboot the whole satellite computer system. Maybe we can just... We can just go and uh, pull back, a, go back to a trusted VM, a trusted container, in the configuration management. But that's what I, what I had to share uh, today. Uh, I appreciate the B sides uh, Cayman's team uh, inviting me to come come back and uh, to uh, B sides and and uh, share with y'all. I really enjoyed uh, visiting the island again. Hope to come back again soon. It's, uh, but y'all have any uh, questions or anything? Yes, sir. He's going to give you a microphone. Here. Hi. Um, you mentioned that they don't do any um, encryption between ground stations and the satellites uh -huh. uh, because of the interference from sun particles. Um, but so, so is that really because um, of the limited bandwidth, because of the interference and retransmissions? And I would assume they would use some type of um, frequency hopping to, yeah. to, to do the transmissions. So okay. is that sufficient to keep the bandwidth up uh, to allow encryption? And aside from that, is there any kind of um, hashing that is done between the ground station and the satellite to ensure the integrity of data? Well, the, the encryption is not that's used on the satellites. Everything I've read, it is, uh, I've, I've been reading here very recently, it's on the FCC mm -hmm. website. Yeah. It, they, uh, they decided that they're not going to force an encryption standard on the commercial satellite industry. So, However, they choose to do uh, the key exchange, the hashing, et cetera, that's all up to the uh, individual satellite companies. 
It's not a four standard like everybody's going to use AES, 512, what have you. So I have no need to know. I don't work for the organizations. And if I did, I would be under NDAs where I couldn't disclose it. Right. So I just, all I can do is just like you said, go out and do a lot of Googling and read what's been published in the open source. Right. And uh, do my own uh, re deductive reasoning. Well, this is, seems to be what happened. But on the, uh, I, like, I like your idea about the uh, changing the spectrum. And I think that you can do some really creative things with software defined radio. And I think, uh, I, don't know for, I don't know personally, but like in the case of what we're seeing in Ukraine, where the Russians started interfering with Starlink, mm -hmm. and then SpaceX sent a code update and fixed it, and now they don't have a problem. So I think you can, uh, with software-defined radios, you can start changing frequencies, and you can work around issues, but encryption, it's just, you know, it's just that not it depends on what the vendors want to, whoever you know, owns the SAS, what they implement. And, okay. You know, cool. That's, that's interesting. It's an really interesting domain to study. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that, was, that was the idea. The idea is that, is it that they don't do the encryption or they stay away from it because of the bandwidth limitations? I don't know if it's a bandwidth issue. I've read, I've read where one individual talked about, about it being a bandwidth concern, but everything that I've read, it's more to do with the space weather because it's the space weather, uh, the solar flares, all the the protons, neutrons, the ions, ionization that's going flowing through space, like solar flares. Right, and and then uh, that that is the biggest issue of disrupting uh, during the single event upsets and flipping bits. Right, and because of that, because of that, they would have a lot of retransmissions because of the interference. Right. So that would then affect the overall bandwidth. Yeah, that could. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what. Yeah, um, I was wondering. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They'd be they'd have to be re-exchanging keys, getting things right. reset. Yeah. And uh, the connection would be up and down. They would lose control of the satellite, uh, being able to manage it because of uh, all the key, constant key exchanges. Yeah. Maybe you get one command, maybe, but you didn't get the second or third command. Where are you at in your command sequence? Right. Because of all the exchanges. Yeah, that we, it could be disruptive. But that's where you have to start using uh, hardened, hardened communications gear that's, that's uh, designed to survive space. Okay. But, but that drives up the cost. And if you're, you know, if you're a university and a researcher on a real cheap uh, budget, you don't have a lot of budget for, you know, you're using Raspberry Pis and Bingle Bones, you got to do the best you can do. Right. You just okay. gonna have to accept the risk uh, that somebody's going to be able to listen to your traffic. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Which is really interesting. Uh, if, you, if you're not aware, a lot, a lot of the computers, uh, Raspberry Pis and Bingle Bones are uh, used for like a lot of these CubeSats. Any more questions? Yeah. Good purposes. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it's all good. I mean, uh, it's great. It's just, you know, everybody's wanting to get into commercial space and I want, and I'm interested. It's like, okay, where does the baseline, what has actually happened with space over the years, and as everyone starts, all these new startups, it's like uh, Silicon Valley, you know, the, the whole internet craze back right. in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, everybody's running into space now. Uh, we need to go and secure these systems. It's like we needed to go and secure the internet and harden web servers and databases back. You know, what, we need to do it with space too. What, what would be the, the commercial value to the small guy here. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have infrastructure in space that's probably communicating quickly with satellites and doing storage compute type things, but what's, what's the guy in the Cayman Islands gonna use it for, let's say? Well, your, uh, your, the, the weather, they uh, say so there's computing in space. One of the reasons they're going, one of the primary applications for putting computing resources in space is say uh, there's weather, weather satellites that could be collecting imagery in space or be looking at certain parts of the island watching for erosion, uh, et cetera, and uh, be able to pre-process the imagery. And instead of sending everything that is collected down and using all the bandwidth to send just everything 
an overworking analyst that are already very busy. Uh, the, if, you, if you have the storage in space, if you have the computing power, then the computer in space can pre-process, apply analytics, play, you know, play the AI, do all the image analysis, get all that automated, so that the imagery is pre-processed and only what you need is sent down. Uh, so, you know, so your, uh, so your military, your uh, whoever, your environmental, whoever is watching the environment and protecting the environment, the national parks, et cetera, can be getting only the imaging that they really need, the best imaging where they can focus instead of having to look at, you know, terabytes of data that, and keeping their bandwidth and running up their cost. They can just use what they need. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of applications, though, that are going to come about as a result of that storage being in space. You know, people aren't going to be limited by the creativity. But the image analysis is what comes to my mind first. Uh, that's the easy one. Any more questions? Uh, I'll, I will tell you, I don't, I don't have a, a slide for it, but if you, hit, if you hit me on LinkedIn, if you want the slides, I'll send you the slides. Uh, or Twitter, I'll send you the slides. If you like them, share, I'll give them to the conference. But if you're interested in playing with uh, satellite software, you can mock up, especially like, you know, if you have children that are interested in space and, and learning about the systems, there is a lot of capabilities available in the open source community. And all you need is the power of a uh, Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone. You don't have to have a high-end computer to run this. There's a uh, uh, OpenSAT kit, Open SAT kit from NASA, freaking NASA. It's going to work. It works good. And, the, and inside of NASA, instead of the open, in the open SAT kit, they have a CFS co uh, core flight software, which is CubeSat software that actually flies. And then it includes uh, Ball Aerospaces, Cosmos, which is a ground system software. And then they have another tool that they give you, and this is all free, called 42, that is an orbit simulator. It's very nice. Uh, there's SATNOGS. There's one called... Uh, that's a S A T N O G S. Check that out. There's a, also NASA has called NOS three N O S three. That's another free uh, resource. Uh, another one is Artemis. Check out Artemis. Uh, and this is all open source. And you can go and uh, you can boot up. Like I said, you can boot up. You can build satellites on your table, on your you know kitchen table with Raspberry Pis and BeagleBone, running uh, core flight software and. Maybe it, this stuff will run in containers, runs in VMs. So if you want, if, you, if you're interested in learning it, you know, more, uh, it's good. It's good it'd be great stuff to take back to you know local schools and help the kids start playing with and see if they can touch it. Uh, and also for security research. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you if you're curious about any of that, I can send you send you lots of links and all this. Like I said, it's all out there on the net. Uh, any more questions? But if nothing, I appreciate y'all letting me come and speak and. Uh, I appreciate all the hospitality of the island. Everything's been great. The food, oh my God, I've eaten so much good food. Met so many nice people. It's been awesome. Thank you.